Okay, uh, the work I'm talking about here, I, I really think that Saturn is the greatest example of how important the ionosphere is to the magnetosphere. And I'm going to demonstrate it with some very dramatic simulations uh, that were done by Shinji, and he and I have been working together with Tomas uh, on this uh, material. Kate Raymer is a student who did some really nice work, and we're still waiting to get it finished. And David Southwood is always an inspiration, even if I usually spend my time arguing with him. I don't know, transitions in this are very slow. Okay, so just to remind you, put in context the outer planet exploration issues, uh, it was just a few months before the first Yosemite meeting that Pioneer 10 became the first spacecraft to fly by a giant gas planet. Pioneer 11 was already almost there. It got there in December of 1974 and swooped by uh, uh, Jupiter and went on to Saturn and was the first spacecraft to uh, explore Saturn. It's often forgotten, but it, it really was a very important spacecraft. And today we can look back on decades of spacecraft exploration uh, and uh, I'm going to concentrate on things that happen at Saturn and Jupiter that blow up things that happen on Earth onto a scale that makes them uh, sort of central to our understanding. And so uh, let's go on and see, I think my first um, uh, slide has to do with some of the differences that have already been mentioned by Melissa and others, the spatial and temporal scales. Magnetospheres of Jupiter and Saturn are huge. Fran pointed that out, um, and Melissa pointed it out. But the important thing about the huge scale is that it implies long, long times, just as Mercury requires very short times. Uh, Jupiter requires very, very long times to carry information at the characteristic thousand kilometer per second speed of a wave. Uh, it takes an hour to travel 50 RJ. And that doesn't even get the signal to the magnetopause. And it certainly doesn't get it very far down the tail at Jupiter. The solar wind, it's a pretty rapidly flowing uh, fluid. But at 400 kilometers per second, it takes over five hours, half of a Jupiter rotation period, for the solar wind to flow from the nose to the terminator of Jupiter. So uh, the north-south orientation of the field has probably changed many, many times in that time scale. It's only the field component that is non-fluctuating, the sort of average spiral field that is of any consequence in terms of a magnetic interaction between the solar wind and the magnetosphere. So these, uh, but these large spatial scales and substantial delays, I think, play, uh, do help us understand something about how forces are imposed. And I think by looking at some of these physical processes at Jupiter and Saturn, we can gain insight into things that happen so quickly at Earth we don't pay attention to them. Okay, now rapid rotation. People have talked about that too, and you've seen a different version of this slide, which I've adapted from Bryce and Ioannidis, that shows that at Earth, Rotation controls only a very small part of the mag. This is looking down on the equatorial plane and flows. Uh, and at Jupiter, it's, uh, it, you have to worry about rotation all the way out to the boundary. Uh, the flow patterns are very different. Uh, the next thing that's coming up is the fact that there's a heavy ion plasma, and that's true for both Saturn and Jupiter. And this heavy ion plasma has its dominant source, as Fran told us, at the moons deep within the magnetosphere, mainly Io at Jupiter, 6RJ, 
the result is that not only do you have stretched plasma sheet field lines in the tail region, but also on the day side. That's from the slingshot effect of all that heavy stuff being rotated around. And the same thing at Saturn, where Enceladus at 5RS is a source of plasma, and you do have a plasma sheet on the day side as well as on the night side. It means also that the plasma has a lot of inertia compared to a proton plasma, and when you combine that with rotation, you get a lot of interesting dynamics. So the question is, how is in, uh, rotation imposed? And uh, of course, in the ionosphere, which is there and important in both of these planets, rotations imposed by collisions. Uh, neutrals from the upper atmosphere, and this is the upper atmosphere, it's not the stuff we see in the cloud tops. Uh, the upper atmosphere, the thermosphere, uh, has neutrals that have good coupling to the denser atmosphere below, and it's hard to slow the ionosphere significantly. In the magnetosphere, rotation is imposed through coupling to the ionosphere. And at Jupiter and Saturn, we can gain insight into just how that works. The, uh, we, it ha helps us because we can see, we can measure the curl of B that gives rise to the field aligned currents, and this helps make the forces clear. So, I can't. Somehow, transitions are very slow in this. Good. Okay. So, what happens is that you start with ions deep within the magnetosphere, five or six planetary radii, in a steady state. You can't just let that mass build up. It starts moving out. So there must be outflow. The outward moving mass conserves angular momentum. So that means that the angular velocity, the fractional change of angular velocity, which is related to the fractional change in outward displacement, I've written it here along a dipole L shell. It increases with sine theta as you move along, if you move a, an L shell out. What that means is that as you go out from the center, the uh, field line begins to lag because, of course, the plasma and the field are frozen together, and there's an increasing lag with radial distance or with sine theta along the field line, and so you end up with curled up field. That curled field, of course, produces a current, which turns out to be a parallel current that is being pulled out of the ionosphere. And here you can see how that curled uh, field looks like in a, mo uh, um, a heuristic model based on uh, on actual measurements of the magnetic field. This is a corona model looking down up toward the equatorial plane. You can see that the curling is at local time dependent, but very, very strong. And here you're looking from the dusk meridian, you're seeing a curl in the field. Um, so the field lines uh, that carry the field aligned current close through, they're pulled at, the current is at low latitudes, pulled out of the ionosphere down to the equatorial plane where it flows radially outward, and then you will be able to see that that produces a force that is trying to accelerate the slowed plasma. This figure is taken from Tom Hill, and it's a paper that we refer to very, very often, uh, more than 300 citations according to Google Scholar. And this, uh, the, this current system here is very closely linked to the main aurora that um, we heard about. And uh, that the field line, the current then go 
closes at high latitude through the ionosphere where it tries to slow the ionosphere. Now the slowing in the ionosphere is done uh, through a J over uh, conductance, Pedersen conductance, which is the change in the electric field. In turn, that produces a change in the flow velocity. If the con conductivity is high, dV is small. If the conductivity is low, you can actually slow the ionosphere. They come into equilibrium over sufficient time, and that's why we can have subco-rotation at Jupiter. Uh, so the co-rotation lag at Jupiter provides a different way of thinking about how you impose magnetospheric rotation. Co-rotation electric fields and equipotential field lines are used at Earth to explain how ionospheric uh, rotation is imposed on the equatorial plasma. But at Jupiter, I think we find a better way to think about this, mag uh, this matter. The flow inertia distorts the field that drives the currents that link the magnetosphere and ionosphere. J cross B forces arise to try to bring the two into equilibrium. This explanation clarifies where the forces are applied and how. The EJ description of magnetospheric processes is not wrong, but a VB description provides a clear physical understanding of the mechanism and shows how the ionosphere controls many aspects of the giant systems, and it's, it gives a good example of why Parker and Vassil Yunus have been urging us to talk about uh, in, a, in a VB language. Now I want to go on to Saturn. Saturn rotates in about the same time scale as Jupiter, about 10.5 hours. Its uh, period is only approximately known, uh, we, can, we have images which we know how fast the clouds are moving. The average cloud motion gives us an idea. But Saturn's magnetic moment is aligned within one degree with the spin axis, so there's no help from tracking magnetic wobble, which was the way in which we uh, learned about Jupiter's rotation period. However, electromagnetic power from low altitudes is modulated at a period that is close to Saturn's rotation period. Uh, it, we call it SKR, it's in the kilometric range. Rural Hiss is also um, modulated at this period. You've already seen this picture in a previous talk. The power goes up and down. Uh, auroral hiss goes up and down. What Don, William, what, what Don Garnett does is to take 120 days of data on a sliding window and obtain a typical frequency for the uh, variation of, of the uh, power spectrum. So he does a power spectrum and he labels it in terms of degrees per day of rotation on this side or period going up down uh, from top to bottom. And this is over several years. And at first they saw only one strong signal. They could tell it came from the south at 10.8 hours. Uh, an important thing about it is that it decreased by of order 1% a year. That makes it hard to believe that it's an internal magnetic field that's rotating. Uh, remarkably, they also found after uh, y several years of the Cassini mission that there was a second um, shorter period uh, 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 emission coming from the northern hemisphere. So two different periods, one from the north, one from the south, uh, and inconsistent with being uh, the rotation of an internal field. If it's not a magnetic anomaly, what is it? Well, that's debated. I'm going to give you a very biased view. Um, so, I, But before I give you my biased view, I want to point out that it's not just the radio emissions that are modulated at what I'm going to call the SKR period. These are electron, uh, these are measurements made in the tail between 40 and about 25 Saturn radii down tail. Uh, you can see that there, you're flapping 
uh, up and down, in and out of the lobe, through the plasma sheet back into the lobe. If you, that's the total magnetic field. Uh, if you look at the radial component, you're starting in the southern lobe, going through the plasma sheet to the north, and doing that every 10.8 hours. Uh, the, uh, the, for the um, people who love magnetic fields, the perturbations in, uh, in BR and B5 are out of phase, which happens if fields are bent back. So the biggest puzzle is, why is the plasma sheet going up and down periodically? Uh, the, the dipole is aligned. At Jupiter, the magnetic field goes up and down because as the dipole rotates, it nods towards you and away from you, and it pulls the plasma sheet up and down. Why is this going up and down? Uh, well, it's not only the plasma sheet that's doing funny things periodically, but here's a, a data of the magnetic field with the total field at the, uh, in blue and the radial component of the field in, in uh, black, and green is the azimuthal component, and this is from 40 uh, Saturn radii into uh, closest approach near 6 and back out to 45. This is the flapping plasma sheet. But in the center, inside of 10, you, get, you can continue to get oscillations. And even at the equator, the phi component remains finite. It, the, the phases between the radial and azimuthal component tell us that the perturbation looks like a uniform field rotating at the SKR period. Uh, based on this observation, Southwood and I proposed that there had to be a system of currents that was actually flowing from one ionosphere through the entire magnetosphere into the other ionosphere, closing through the ionosphere and going back. We postulated that they'd be flowing on a magnetic shell and that this whole magnetic shell would be rotating. So we, by, in this way, we explained what was seen in the magnetic perturbations, but no hint of why. It doesn't indicate whether the forces driving these field-aligned currents are in the magnetosphere with a passive ionosphere or in the ionosphere with a passive magnetosphere. Now, I try to convince you that it's the ionosphere, but even if I don't, uh, I have some nice pictures. Uh, so the question is, why is it not straightforward to establish the primary momentum source? Well, it's just because the magnetosphere and the ionosphere are so strongly coupled, and if you move one end of a field line, it can very quickly show up at the other end. And it's a challenge to decide which is doing the pushing and pulling, and which is reacting to the push and pull. So uh, I, oh, it has changed. Oh, no, it hasn't. Well, OK. <laughs> I'm going to push it again. OK. So we propose that the driver of this is in the upper atmosphere, closely coupled into the ionosphere. Now, the reason we want to put, uh, put the driver in the upper atmosphere is the following. The periodicities remain not only very slowly varying, but they, the phase of the periodicity remains unchanged from one six-month period to the next six-month period to the next six-month period. The phase d doesn't skip by tens of degrees. It remains, uh, on average, fixed in the slowly varying period system. That means that something has to be bringing the magnetosphere back into the same periodicity and the same phase every time the solar wind buffets it in a major way. And so we're looking for something that has high inertia. And we'd rather think of the thermosphere as having high inertia than the magnetosphere. So we think the source has to be in the ionosphere, but that the ionosphere is coupled 
to the thermosphere, and we uh, produce a model that drives currents from the ionosphere into the magnetosphere, has those currents rotating periodically, and we compare with just about everything that has been measured in the system and find almost quantitative agreement. Here's some, uh, one example. There is a variation of the intensity of the SKR emission with local time, and uh, this is a plot the black curve is the plot of the observations peaking at about uh, between 9 and 10 local time. And here's what we get for the field-aligned currents which drive SKR emission. And we've even got this little bounce back uh, at, uh, at the end of the plot. So we really get a lot of, uh, we can uh, reproduce the uh, amplitudes of the uh, of the perturbations that I've showed you in many, many of the parameters. Uh, there are, the problem is our model requires that we generate currents, field-aligned currents in the ionosphere. How do you do that with a vortical flow? I'll show you the vortical flow structure that we've imposed. We imagine this vortical flow structure is present and is rotating at under the ionosphere at the SKR period, putting in momentum at not at the rate at which the ionosphere is rotating, but it's actually moving relative to the ionosphere. Now, the only way we can think of doing that is through uh, vortic vortical flows in the thermosphere. David Sa Southwood has other ideas how you could make this uh, uh, flow system. There are no measurements available in the thermosphere at Saturn. We can't uh, test our assumption, and it's not clear from atmospheric theory how to produce vortical winds with an uh, M equals 1 azimuthal structure. But what I'm going to show you is how this um, model uh, works in, in Saturn's magnetosphere. So here are the flows. Uh, you can see one vortex going this way. Color gives you the vorticity, and it, the, the other one going that way. Uh, in some of our simulations, we center the vortex only in the southern hemisphere at 70 degrees. In others, uh, we have both a southern source and a northern source with a northern source at slightly higher. Did I get my two minutes? I still have time, okay. <laughs> All right, um, so um, uh, the, we have steady, a steady nominal solar wind, no day-side reconnection. We've had the solar wind field is oriented southward, so parallel to the equatorial field at the nose of the magnetosphere. The changes are all driven internally, and you're going to see that they're pretty dramatic. So the ionosphere is driving the magnetic perturbations um, in density, makes a partial ring current that's both fixed and rotating. And uh, I will now, uh, this is a pair of, it's, it's movies, but I just want to tell you what you're going to be looking at. This is the equatorial plane view Color represents density perturbations. If you can, uh, there in both images, the uh, unit vectors along the perturbation magnetic field are seen, and you can see that you've got a roughly uniform field in the region inside 10 uh, Saturn radii, and it's doing sort of looking like an equatorial dipole elsewhere. Here I'm showing in color J phi, and again, uh, so the azimuthal current. And, um, and so here you see where the hours are marked down here. Rotation is at the SKR period. What you can see is that there's a density enhancement that sort of spins around, but then it sort of breaks apart and turns into two peaks instead of one. So you've got something being driven at only one period, but it's doing weird things. It isn't just rotating. Here we see that there is a roughly local time fixed partial ring current, 
but there's also a rotating partial ring current. Those are all working together to impose the perturbations that are observed in both particle and field properties. Uh, now, the other thing that the magnet, I showed you then sort of the sign of spinning variations that are in being imposed. But the magnetosphere also breathes in the sense that you see it blow up and collapse, blow up and collapse, steady solar wind. And you will also see that these field aligned currents we're driving out of the ionosphere are making the whole plasma sheet flap. And this is one of my you know, Oscar-nominated movies. <laughs> one of the things that I like, because I never trust simulations, is to see that the steady solar wind shows no perturbations at all while uh, I anywhere outside of the bow shock. The whole magnetopause is being pushed out in, and the magnetosheath being pushed out and collapsing back, pushed out and collapsing back. That's happening oh, while all of these uh, density perturbations are, are uh, rotating around the magnetosphere. And the interesting thing is that when you dipolarize the field, the density goes down at the equator because all of a sudden the density or the flux tube content can move off the equator. It's the, that's the effect of centrifugal forces. I mean, it's kind of fun to see that the equatorial density is highest when you get it an expanded magnetosphere and it goes down when you get a... Uh, the, the color here is density, I failed to tell you that. Notice also the magneto, the magneto tail, how the plasma sheet is flapping up and down. It's actually uh, launching plasmoids once every rotation. That's something that hasn't been identified in the data. I think it has to do partly with the uh, asymmetries of the system and that most of the uh, data have been examined very near the equatorial plane and a lot of the activity is going on at higher latitudes. So the bottom line is that at Saturn, uh, the magnetosphere and ionosphere are tightly coupled in very important ways that reveal um, uh, a large number of signatures modulated at what I call the SKR period. These signatures cannot reflect the interior rotation period because the period changes too quickly. Period doesn't correspond to the rotation period of magnetospheric plasma that subco-rotates outside of about five uh, Saturn radii. And it's probably through cu uh, coupling with rotational anomalies of the thermosphere. And there are some people here who are interested in thermospheres and thermosphere-ionosphere coupling. And I urge you to look at whether a rap rapidly rotating giant planet can somehow make vortices that go up to high, uh, to high latitudes and could drive this. At Jupiter, the ionosphere controls plasma rotation, not at strict co-rotation. I did, want, did want to talk about how it controlled interchange motion, but uh, it looked as if it was making the talk too long. And some of these features may have parallels in the terrestrial magnetosphere on different temporal and spatial scales. And I'm always hopeful that we can look for some of those things. And so I just want to end with, uh, and this it, wonderful photograph was provided to me by Vahe, and I, doc I have to say I doctored it. Time for a couple of qu uh, questions. Uh, excuse me if I missed something, but has it been precluded that there could be a magnetic anomaly involved in uh, these periodicities? Uh, so uh, in case people didn't hear, is it, has it, is it precluded that there's a magnetic anomaly involved? I, I, my dynamo theory friends, 
tell me it's pretty hard to make a magnetic anomaly that will drift, will change its rotation rate by 1% a year. I mean, it's really that, lo the sec you could probably, if you want, if, if I give you one magnetic anomaly, we could have two. So we could have a different one dominating the north and south. But the drift rate seems to be too high for any sensible dynamo theory. Yeah, I think there's a lesson here for the astrophysicists. Uh, you know, astrophysicists have an article of faith that a perfectly aligned neutron star will not pulse. Uh, and that therefore, a pulsar implies a significant tilt between the dipole and the spin axis. All right, you give Saturn, me an... Uh, Saturn no. gives the lie to that. Uh, well, uh, you give, that gives me an opportunity to tell you a, a little bit about a paper of Southwood and Cowley uh, uh, and, and work up a paper by David where he is, uh, his view of the way you drive this uh, anomaly is by having the polar cap on open field lines rotating at a fixed rate. And then if it's, the polar cap is on open field lines, it has to transfer angular momentum into the solar wind. You cannot transfer angular momentum with an m equals zero wave you need to break axial symmetry. And that means that if you have a pulsar trying to rotate around an aligned magnetic field, that magnetic field will be carrying axial angular momentum and will end up wiggling back and forth. And I think it's a very pretty idea. And it's already been, uh, the, the analogy has been made. But your model that you just showed pulses very clearly yeah. without that effect included. Yeah. No, no, I mean, because this, this, the, if you have the uh, polar cap wiggling with this angular momentum breaking, I mean, m equals one symmetry, it produces the very kind of, of flow vortices that we've imposed. So it does both. Pat, you'll have the last word. <laughs> okay, I have a quick question. The S Saturn SKR is different speeds in the two different hemispheres and they both can happen at once. So what does that do to your model when you're trying to uh, impose one from one hemisphere and another from the other hemisphere? How does that work? Well actually, uh, I don't want to take too much time, but it turns out that the, the, uh, the uh, signals propagate not only through field aligned currents, but also through compressional signals. So you get a compressional signal that actually tends to die out as it gets toward the other hemisphere. So you get dominant response at the southern period in the southern hemisphere and the northern period in the northern hemisphere, but in the equatorial region, you see both, and it, they've been extracted from magnetic perturbations, and we can see them in the plasma perturbations in our simulation. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's a combination of the two. The, the real puzzle is what's happening now that it is northern summer, and the reports we have are that the two frequencies have not crossed, they haven't stabilized. There's just apparently a chaotic variation of the periodicity going on. We don't understand it. We'll wait to run a model till they tell us what's happening.